It's Halloween, and chances are many of you have been indulging in some scary movies over the last few weeks. Maybe some of you have plans to watch some scary movies tonight. Maybe you'll be in bed by eight. I don't know. I'm not here to judge. A popular subgenre of horror films is known as body horror, which plays off of our fears of losing control of our own bodies. Um, either to aliens like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, or technology like The Fly. Or to The Thing in The Thing. Or The Stuff in The Stuff. Or The Blob, and you get the idea. The idea that our own bodies or the bodies of those around us could be weaponized in some way is a, a deep instinctual fear. There's a reason why the trope of, you know, patient gets wheeled into the emergency room and infects the entire staff with a mystery illness thing gets used so much. And yet in February of 1994, this actually happened. A woman got wheeled into an ER and the, the minute a needle pierced her skin, she emitted a toxic poison that made people around her just start collapsing to the floor. This is the somehow 100% true story of the toxic lady. A mystery that doctors and scientists have been struggling to explain ever since. February 19th, 1994 was just like any other day for the staff of Riverside General Hospital. A car accident or two, a drug overdose, an old guy complaining of chest pains. Nothing out of the ordinary for an LA suburb. And then at 8.15 in the evening, paramedics wheeled in a 31-year-old Hispanic woman who was breathing shallow and barely conscious. They moved her into a space marked Trauma Room 1 and began trying to stabilize her. They, uh, they assessed what they knew so far. Her name was Gloria Ramirez, she was 31 years old, she was being treated for cervical cancer. And now, for whatever reason, her vital signs were crashing. Along with the shallow breathing, her blood pressure was dropping fast. Her heart was beating too fast for the chambers to fill with blood. So they gave her lidocaine and brachilium to control her rapid heartbeat, as well as Ativan, Valium, and Versed to help sedate her. At this point, hospital staff were pouring into the room to try to get her situation under control, including RN Susan Kane, resident Julie Gorchinsky, and the head of emergency Umberto Ochoa. A respiratory therapist named Maureen Welch used an ambubag on her to help her breathe. But nothing they did seemed to work. Ramirez's vital signs continued to plummet to the point they had to use a defibrillator to restart her heart. When they cut off her shirt to apply the paddles, they noticed a kind of oily sheen covering her body that seemed to give off a fruity, garlicky smell. The RN, Susan Kane, took a blood sample for analysis, and she noticed that the blood kind of smelled strange. This is actually not that uncommon for chemotherapy patients, but the chemo scent is usually a bit more putrid. This had more of an ammonia smell to it. Even weirder, after she drew the blood, she noticed in the vial there were like small manila-colored particles floating around in the blood sample. And this is where things get really weird. Because she barely had a chance to even say anything about it before she literally fell to the floor, saying her face felt like it was burning. Unable to even stand, the staff had to put her on a gurney and whisk her out of the room, but as she was being whisked out, Gorchinsky started to feel lightheaded. She left the room to go to the nurse's station and kind of get her head together when one of the nurses asked if she was okay and she just fell to the floor and began to shake uncontrollably, barely able to breathe. At about the same time, Maureen Welsh fell to the floor back in the trauma room and her arms and legs were like stiff and uncontrollable. This was officially the breaking point and the head of emergency, Umberto Ochoa, ordered the ER evacuated. Nurses and doctors immediately scrambled to wheel their patients outside into the parking lot where they kind of set up a makeshift temporary outdoor trauma center. Ochoa and a few others stayed behind to try to save Ramirez's life, but they were unsuccessful. She was pronounced dead at 8.50, just 35 minutes after she was wheeled in. But now, they had to figure out what the hell just happened. <laughs> so to be safe, they moved her body to an isolation room, and along the way, one of the two orderlies began to vomit and complain that her skin was burning. By the end of the night, 23 of the 37 people on staff were experiencing some kind of symptom, five of which were actually hospitalized. Julie Gorchinsky got it the worst. She would eventually spend two weeks in intensive care, suffering from hepatitis, pancreatitis, and something called avascular necrosis, which is a condition where uh, the bone starts to get deprived of blood and dies off. What the hell happened to Gloria Ramirez that caused her to secrete this mystery toxic substance that affected two dozen people? Was it the chemo medicine? Was she poisoned? Was she like an act of terrorism where somebody used her as a kind of human chemical weapon? There is no shortage of theories around this event, and for good reason. It's, it's one of the craziest medical mysteries ever documented. One that would have Gloria Ramirez go down in history, unfortunately, as the toxic lady. Here's what we know about what happened, and uh, the best theory that's been put forth so far. All right, so back on the night of February 19th, as the ER staff was treating their patients in the parking lot, uh, some of those patients being the staff themselves, a team of investigators arrived in hazmat suits to search the ER. They were looking for any kind of volatile toxicant that could still be in the emergency room's air, one of which that they were looking for was hydrogen sulfide. 
Hydrogen sulfide is a poison that can kill somebody with one or two whiffs if it's at high enough concentrations. It also tends to smell like rotten eggs. That's the, the sulfide bit. And that was also a bit of a problem, because nobody really reported smelling rotten eggs when the incident occurred. Uh, it doesn't matter because the investigators didn't find anything. They also looked for phosgene. This is a gas that's been used in the preparation of several organic chemicals, but it's also been used in chemical warfare. Yeah, it's pretty brutal. What it actually does is it tears open the capillaries and the lungs, and the victims basically just drown in their own blood. So that's fun. <laughs> Luckily for everybody on staff that night, uh, that's not what they experienced, and it also wasn't found in the air by the investigators. That or anything else that they could use to explain it. So then they examined the body, uh, still in their moon suits to be safe. They took blood and tissue samples and then sealed her body in an airtight aluminum crate, again, just to be safe. These samples were then sent to the Riverside coroner. He wasn't able to find anything that really stood out to him, so he sent it on for more advanced testing. Using a computer-guided combined gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, they found codeine, lidocaine, Tylenol, and Tegon, an anti-nausea medication, none of which is unexpected for somebody going through chemo. There were, though, a few things that were unexpected. One of which was amine, which is a derivative of ammonia. This may have contributed to that ammonia-like smell that Susan Cain noticed. The second standout result was nicotinamide. Nicotinamide is a B vitamin that's crucial to our health. Um, you can actually find it in a lot of multivitamins. I've taken it myself at times. So that might mean nothing, but it, it can also be mixed into drugs like methamphetamines, which could mean a whole different thing. And last but not least is dimethyl sulfone. And this one was interesting because it's usually used as an industrial solvent. But it can be produced naturally in our bodies from amino acids that contain sulfur. Um, it usually breaks down in the liver in three days, so it's rarely detectable, but there was a lot of it in Gloria's blood. So this was weird, but regardless, it wasn't enough to kill her, much less poison the rest of the ER. So, yeah. With still no answers, the California Department of Health and Human Services stepped in to investigate. They assigned doctors Anna Maria Osario and Kristen Waller to the case, and they interviewed 34 people who were on staff that night, compiled all the data, and eventually concluded that Wait for it. It was an outbreak of mass sociogenic illness. Mass hysteria, like the dancing plague. Their theory was that whatever it was in the blood that had that smell triggered a panic attack that just sort of traveled around the room. They cited the lack of any evidence for a poison and also the fact that women on staff suffered the most severe symptoms, which sounds kind of sexist, but the authors of the report were both women, so yeah, do with that what you will. They also cited the fact that the people who uh, responded the worst to this had skipped dinner that evening, not to mention the fact that Gloria had been in an ambulance with paramedics who also suffered no symptoms, even after being in close contact with her blood in a small enclosed space. That is weird, but still, so much of this theory just doesn't make sense. First of all, this wasn't a bunch of, like, shrinking violets. These were experienced ER doctors and nurses. They saw car crash victims and gunshots on a daily basis. There's no way that a bad smell was going to make them all faint. And by the way, it wasn't just fainting. They had real diagnosed physiological problems from this. Uh, Julie Gorchinsky, she lost so much bone density, she had to be on crutches for six months. Six months that she wasn't able to work. And because of this report, now she couldn't collect any workers' comp insurance. So, yeah. She filed a lawsuit. I think, understandably so. So this is when Gorchinsky and her lawyer reached out to Brian Anderson at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. He's actually the guy who ran the gas chromatograph tests back in March. They felt like there must be something to those anomalies that were found that I talked about a minute ago. He was still pretty stumped by this whole thing, so he enlisted the help of the lab's deputy director, a guy named Pat Grant. Let me just stop for a second and acknowledge that I know I'm throwing a lot of names at you here, and you're probably starting to feel like you're getting in the weeds, uh, and we are getting in the weeds a little bit, and we're going to get a little bit more in the weeds, because some of this is about to get really technical, but hang with me. This is, this is really wild. Okay, so we got this new guy, Pat Grant, right? So he's looking at this file while he's flying to a business meeting in Washington, D.C., new pair of eyes and all that, and he notices something, something that was missed before. So he speculated that the lab's detection of dimethyl sulfone might have actually been a slightly different chemical, dimethyl sulfoxide, also known as DMSO. Okay, what the hell is DMSO? DMSO is a heavy-duty degreaser. It's often sold in gel form in hardware stores, but it has a really interesting history. So it turns out that Grant used to work in a kinesthetics lab with athletes back in the day, and it was actually a bit of a folk remedy for, like, achy muscles and joints that the athletes used to use. Like, it actually used to be sold for that purpose, but then it was kind of banned in the 1970s after some lab tests showed that it could alter the lens of the eye. But still, you know, a lot of people swore by it, and let's face it, when you're in pain, you'll pretty much do anything to make it go away. So it actually wasn't uncommon for people to just go to the hardware store and get the industrial form of it and use that to treat everything from, you know, arthritis, muscle strains, and yes, cancer pain. 
This might be the explanation for that oily sheen that they saw all over her body in the ER. Also the garlicky smell. And DMSO can combine with oxygen to create dimethyl sulfone, which would explain why it was so high in her blood. Plus the paramedics had put her on oxygen on the way to the hospital in the ambulance, so her blood was flush with oxygen. Ha, uh -huh, see, okay, so the pieces are coming together now. It's all making sense, ha ha. Except this still doesn't actually explain the incident at all. None of those chemicals are toxic in any way. But this did get Grant thinking, like if you could combine oxygen with DMSO to create dimethyl sulfone, what other chemicals might be created with that? I mean, especially considering how high her oxygen levels were. So he hit up the Merck Index, basically a, a Bible of more than 10,000 biological, chemical, and drug substances. And yeah, it turns out if you add two more oxygen atoms to dimethyl sulfone, which is written out as CH32SO2, you get dimethyl sulfate, CH32SO4. And yes, we have gone from dimethyl sulfoxide to dimethyl sulfone to dimethyl sulfate. Thanks, science. Okay, so there's a chance that she was able to make dimethyl sulfate. What is that? Well, it turns out it's a uh, nerve gas. And it's not just a little poisonous either. Tests have shown that a 10 minute exposure to half a gram dispersed over a cubic meter of air can be fatal. In fact, it was tested as a nerve agent for war, but it was never actually used. It basically kills cells and exposed tissues like the eyes, lungs, and mouth. And its symptoms include convulsions, delirium, paralysis, and coma. All of which is lining up perfectly with the symptoms from the hospital staff. All right, so here's where things stand. Gloria Ramirez was suffering from cancer and used DSMO as a folk remedy to help with the pain. She collapsed, possibly from cancer-related kidney failure, and the paramedics put an oxygen mask on her in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Her blood became oversaturated with oxygen, which mixed with the DMSO to form dimethyl sulfone, which mixed with more oxygen to create dimethyl sulfate that was dissolved in her blood. So the guys at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory tested this theory using a substance called Ringer Solution. It's kind of a stand-in for blood. Not only were they able to get it to work at normal body temperature, when the solution cooled to room temperature, the dimethyl sulfone began to crystallize. Those crystals explain the white particulates that they found in the sample of her blood. So all of this is fitting and working and coming into place, but at least still one mystery, which is how did this dissolved dimethyl sulfate become gaseous? Dimethyl sulfate has a pretty high vapor point, around 148 degrees Celsius, which is maybe one of the reasons why it was never used in combat. But that is 148 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere of pressure. The lower the pressure, the lower the vapor point. For example, if you put water in a vacuum chamber and started lowering the pressure, it would eventually start to boil at room temperature, which is why if you're ever exposed to the vacuum of space, the last thing you would experience would be the water on your eyeballs boiling off. Sleep tight, kids. Okay, so with that in mind, when you get your blood drawn by a nurse or a phlebotomist, they use one of these. This is called a vacutainer, which is a container filled with a vacuum. So when they take your blood, they stick the needle into the vein, they pop the vacutainer on there, and that vacuum is what pulls the blood into the tube. It's, it's pretty brilliant. But in this one unique, incredibly specific case, that vacuum caused a tiny amount of the dimethyl sulfate to vaporize, and it poisoned 23 people. Because say it with me, folks, pressure changes everything. And this provides the last ribbon and the last bow to wrap up the mystery of Gloria Ramirez, the toxic lady. Of course, this theory has its detractors. Those who disagree with this theory point out the fact that dimethyl sulfate doesn't really hit people the way that it did the staff. Um, it's really more like tear gas. So while the staff didn't start to cry from the vapors, they did report a burning sensation. And also usually its effects take hours for it to materialize, but the staff experienced it like immediately. For what it's worth, Ramirez's family isn't buying this theory either. Um, they insist that she had never heard of DMSO and they requested an independent autopsy two months after she died. But unfortunately by that point, her body was extremely decomposed and the heart and a lot of other organs were missing. Also apparently what was left was contaminated with fecal matter. So, yikes. This, of course, has led to a lot of speculation that the hospital was involved in some kind of cover-up. Maybe the wildest theory that's been floating around is that the hospital was manufacturing methamphetamines and smuggling into the IV bags, one of which was accidentally used on Ramirez. But in the end, so far anyway, the Livermore Labs theory is the most accepted so far. Um, and it's got plenty of tests and experiments to back it up. But still, it is, it's just a theory. We'll likely never know exactly what happened on that weird night in 1994. Um, luckily nothing like that's ever happened since that we know of. Which actually does lead me to believe the DMSO theory, um, it was just such a unique set of circumstances, you know, everything had to be just right for it to happen. And I should probably close by recognizing that at the heart of this mystery is an actual person. 
somebody who was probably a really good person and was tragically taken far too soon and is sadly remembered for this one single weirdest thing about her life, that being the way that it ended. So, rest in peace. The human body is capable of some really weird things, am I right? Which is why I did a whole six-part series called Mysteries of the Human Body, which you can see over on Nebula. I didn't talk about Gloria Ramirez in that uh, series, but it totally could have fit there. It, it would have totally fit in. I did talk about people like the Elephant Man, the Tree Man of Java, Robert Wadlow, the tallest man in history, Lucia Zarate, the smallest woman in history, and many others in the Human Oddities episode. Other episodes include the weirdest plagues of all times, diseases we can't seem to cure. I even devoted a whole episode to the mystery of aging. It's a fun series. I got a whole set built for it and we had special graphics and stuff. I mean, I know I haven't promoted this in a while on here, but I'm still proud of it. I think it came out well. But if that's not your thing, I've actually got a new ongoing series called Forgotten Atrocities. It's about, you know, forgotten atrocities throughout history. There's a few episodes of that out already. The most recent one was about the Irish famine. And those are just my exclusive projects. There are some Nebula originals from Real Engineering, Windover Productions, Real Life Lore, many others of your favorite educational YouTubers. Also, you can watch all of our regular YouTube content on there ad-free and earlier than everybody else can see it. Nebula is a place that we built together so that we can have a curated platform outside the confines of the YouTube algorithm. So if you like my kind of content and you haven't checked it out, you really ought to do so. It's really cool. And the best way to do that is to get it for free with a subscription to CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is the best streaming service in the world for documentary programming on pretty much any subject you could possibly think of. Uh, science, history, art, food, you name it, it's all there. And if you go to curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott, you'll get the Nebula bundle, which will give you both streaming services for 26% off. That makes it a grand total of $14.79 for an entire year. Two streaming services for an entire year. It's kind of bonkers. You'll be getting a whole year of two amazing streaming platforms for smart and nerdy content for less than the cost of one movie ticket. And you'll be supporting some worthy creators in the process. So it's a win-win. So again, that's curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott. Do go check it out. Link's down in the description. All right, thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon who are keeping the lights on around here, forming an awesome community, and just being a great place to, for me to get feedback from people. I really do appreciate it. Uh, there's some new people I need to shout out real quick. We've got uh, Joseph Kubertek, I think, uh, Maria Hiller, Gangsta Jeebus, Charles Hicks, Charlotte, Captain Confused, Elena Staggs, Mark Ellison, Stephen Thurston, Kiyomi, Jan Ovonsky, <laughs> Christy Gates, uh, Devin O'Connell, Devin O'Donnell, sorry, Simon Simeon, Stacey Ivey, Matthew, Chris Bush, and Scary Miss Mary. Perfect for a Halloween episode. Well, thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, get access to exclusive live streams, and just be a part of an awesome community, just go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this one. I'll put another mystery video up here that I've worked on. Maybe. Maybe the Summerton Man video, that was a pretty popular one. Uh, or you can check out any of the other little, like, little videos down here on the side that have my face on them. Check them out. If you enjoy them and you're not subscribed, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening and spooky happy Halloween this evening. And I'll catch you next time. Love you guys. Take care.